Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Mr. Paul Rosenzweig. Uh, he is a graduate of University of Chicago Law School. Uh, following graduation, he clerked for the Honorable uh, R. Lanier Anderson III of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. He has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security and twice as Acting Assistant Secretary for International Affairs. He serves as an edit a senior editor of the Journal of National Security, Law, and Policy, as an adjunct professor at the National Defense University and George Washington University, and is the founder of Red Branch Law and Consulting. Mr. Rosenfeld. Thanks. Uh, can we get this unmuted? I think I can. There. Yeah, OK, good. Now we can get it unmuted. Well, um, great. Thanks, first, for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I enjoy it. I think the thing I like most about it is that there is absolutely no snow on the ground here. Having come from Washington, D.C., where the snowfall this year exceeds the height of my wife, yeah, uh, she's a short woman, yes, but really, we've never had that much snow in the history of Washington. So, so, uh, so it's good to get out and uh, get to come here and, and talk about some stuff uh, that I got to work on uh, both when I was at DHS and now in my private capacity. Uh, I think the first question uh, that's really worth asking is, why are we talking about airport security? I mean, why are we not talking about uh, train security, mass transit security, or the security of malls. I mean, we used to, when I was at DHS, we used to think that probably the most horrific thing that could happen to America would be four guys go into the Mall of America on the Friday after Thanksgiving with four AK-47s and, you know, kill 500 people. Uh, you know, and, that, and frankly, there's nothing you can really do to prevent that. So why are we fixated on airport security? And the answer, of course, is that Al-Qaeda is, right? Um, they've been after airplanes uh, since 1995. The Bajinka plot is a plot that, that got uncovered in the Philippines uh, that we foiled, and it didn't happen. Then 9-11, Richard Reed, the transatlantic liquid bomb plot out of the UK in, in 06. And then, of course, you know, we scheduled this talk before Abdul Muttalib's uh, the underwear bombers uh, thing, but you know, it's timely, so it's happening today. My, uh, my grandkids call him Captain Underpants. Uh, uh, so Al-Qaeda's fixated on it, and just as an aside, uh, many of us sort of think that this is actually, when you think about it, their strategic weakness, right? It's that once they get a hold of an idea, they don't let go, and that makes them a little easier to predict. Uh, if they've been more uh, nimble, they might actually be changing to the malls or, uh, or the New York subway system or something like that. Um, but it's not just Al-Qaeda, of course. Other people are also fixated on the air transit system. Uh, the uh, the uh, Lockerbie bombing the, that was traced back to Libya, the Air India plot, probably you don't know about that, but that was a bunch of uh, Sikh, uh, Sikhs that bombed an, an Air India plane that was traveling from Canada back to India, uh, blew up over over Canada in 85, and then most recently the Chechen bomb plot, also one you probably don't know about, but an Aeroflot plane was blown up by uh, two women Chechen terrorists who back in uh, 04, shades of Abdul Muttalib, they smuggled the bombs, uh, the liquid, uh, I mean the plastic explosive one thinks, we, are, we believe, in their braziers. Uh, so, you know, the uh, more things change, the more they say the same. Abdul Muttalib is not terribly much different from the two Chechen women from uh, 2004. But even so, um, you, you kind of ask, OK, you know, that's a lot of fixations on airplanes. But really, to what effect? That is, why, why should we care? I mean, if a plane goes down, that's a tragedy. A lot of people die. But does it matter that much? Um, one of the things we did back in 07 was we did a, a tabletop, a uh, tabletop exercise where you get a bunch of senior decision makers around. There was the deputy of uh, Homeland Security and the Deputy Home Secretary for the UK. And we asked ourselves the question, you know, what if the transatlantic bomb plot, that's the liquid bomb plot from 2006, had actually succeeded? Uh, and I want you to actually put yourselves in, in that mindset and imagine that you are the Secretary of Homeland Security or the President of the United States, right? And all of a sudden, you know that three planes have gone down in the middle of the Atlantic within an hour of each other, all dropped off the radar screen, and that's all you know. You know, what's the first thing you do? Anybody want to play? Yeah, what's the first thing you do? Exactly. Every plane that is going across the Atlantic, perhaps every plane that is flying in the US and the UK and Europe is, is grounded. That's exactly what 
Um, we predicted we would do. That's exactly what we did on 9-11. That's exactly what we would do again. But here's the problem. These things went down in the middle of the Atlantic, right? The black boxes are not available. They're at 15,000 feet. Uh, we, we first, we, first thing that we did was we said, well, let's send the Navy and go get the black boxes. And the input back was, no can do. You know, our, our subs just can't find them that deep. They're crushed. Now, imagine you're the president of the United States, right? Or the prime minister of, of UK or president of France, right? And you've stopped all the planes. And you don't know what went wrong. When are you going to let planes fly again? When are you going to say to yourself, OK, even though I don't know it, uh, the economy is, is so dependent upon this that we're going to allow the planes to begin flying again? Uh, it's a terrible place for a politician to be, because either decision he makes is likely to be wrong. He lets him fly, and another one goes down. He's out of a job, right? The Secretary of Homeland Security loses his job. The Home Secretary loses his job. Prime Minister loses his next election, right? But if he keeps him down, uh, you know, the economy goes, goes pear-shaped. Uh, and the security analysts, guys like me, who are designed to actually do this and, and stop these events, um, we're in no better shape because we're guessing. I mean, we know about the liquid bomb plot now because we had human intelligence that broke it. We know about the underwear bomber now uh, because we found him and we broke it. But we don't know what we don't know. You know, the Donald Rumsfeld's famous, you know, the unknown unknowns. In this case, are really unknown. If you don't know what brings the pop plane down. You don't know what security measures to add to stop the next one from happening. Um, so in the game, the end result was that transatlantic flights were completely suspended for an unknown period of time. We reached the end of the game, and nobody still ha had the stones to, to actually start the planes flying again. The economic effects were catastrophic. So we fixate on airport security not just because um, Al Qaeda uh, is fixated on it, and other terrorists are, but because we think that, in fact, airplanes, air transport, is one of those critical path technologies that is a large fraction of what makes the global economy go. And, uh, and so it is actually a linchpin of our economic freedom, our economic success. And so it is actually a real vulnerability point. And if you flip, flip that back, maybe that's part of the strategic strength of what Al-Qaeda has been trying to do, which is they recognize that. And they recognize that if they can um, undermine our confidence in what is a crucial technology for our own way of life and freedom, you know, they're winning the battle in some ways. So what do we do about it? Right? This is all introduction of policy before we get to any law. But what do we do about it? Well, we have a strategy. Now, we really do. Uh, yes, we really do. I know it sometimes doesn't look that way. And this is our security strategy. You know, there are lots of other pieces to our counterterrorism strategy that aren't on the plate for today. You know, we go to Afghanistan to, to disrupt their bases. Right? We put in uh, things to track financing or communication so that we can, get, so we can stop money flows and communication flows. All those are not kind of on the plate for today's discussion. What I want to talk today is our strategy just about providing airport security. Right? Providing uh, an ability to stop what we fear will be the next attempt to blow up a plane and bring it down or drive it into a building. And there are three components to this strategy. They didn't develop, you know, they didn't spring full blown from the head of Zeus like, uh, like Diana did. They were developed kind of episodically and organically over the course of the last eight years. But we've actually pretty much settled on them. And they're well articulated in some of the strategy documents that are out, at, out from DHS and right now. And there are three of them. One is pushing the borders out, which is basically, let's do everything as soon as we can and as far away from America as we can. We want to get information about who's traveling early before they fly. We want to do our physical screening. You know, if it's a plane that's coming from uh, Holland, we want to do it in Holland, not here, when they arrive I I at, um, at the uh, airport at Dulles. The second is, and this is the one that probably leads you all to great frustration, layers of defense. The more independent layers of defense that you put in, the more likely you are to be effective at stopping um, a, uh, an attack. Now, they actually have to be independent layers, right? They can't be things that are dependent for their success on each other. But an example of two things that are independent would be cockpit doors, which work whether or not there are air marshals on the plane, and air marshals who work and do their job, whether or not the cockpit doors are strengthened or weakened. And if you do the math, you can actually calculate out that if you have three, for example, 60% effective layers 
uh, of, of uh, security, you can get to a 94% effectiveness level. And that's actually part of the answer everybody always says, and they're right, that the TSA screeners at the airports, who you all know and, and love dearly, uh, just as I do, um, you know, when we test them, they run at about 40 to 50% effectiveness uh, you know, uh, on, a, on a good day. But, but that's actually not a bad rate for, for finding unknown unknowns. And it's not a bad rate in the context of being not one of three, but you know, we're going to talk about a, a half dozen, dozen layers today. It's not a bad add-on. Uh, plus, they have something that a lot of the other layers don't have, which is a visible deterrent effect just by being there they seem to have an effect on people's behavior. The third concept of our strategy is risk-based allocation of resources. Uh, there are some things, like physical screening at TSA, that we do to everybody. Everybody goes through the metal detector no matter what. But there are other things that we do uh, that are, involve targeted resources, talking to people, pulling people out for secondary screening at airports, being a good example, that are, we hope, based not upon one size fits all for everybody, but on a realization that more information about people, about what they do, or more information about things lets us invest our limited and scarce investigative uh, inspection resources in the things that are or likely to be the greatest threat and require the greatest focus. So these are our three theories, and, uh, or our three strategies for how to do airport security, how to do any physical uh, security. We use the same basic model in cargo container security as well. And all of the things that we do at the airports kind of stem from these uh, ideas about being the most effective way. Now, we could talk about 500 different things um, in, in, a, in, a, in a discussion today because they do about that many at an airport. Actually, it's more like two dozen. But I picked out three for today. Identification requirements, airport body scanners, and the analysis of personally identifiable information, just as examples. And my last slide is a list of another dozen that I'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A. But these are the three I want to talk about today. First is uh, identification requirements. And it poses both a policy question and a legal question, as, as does everything we do. The policy question is, actually we should, uh, is do we really want to know who's flying? Could we just get away with physical screening, with making everybody take off their shoes, making everybody um, open up their bags, putting all the bags through scanners, and all that? And the answer is yes, we could, right? I mean, in theory, we could uh, rely completely and exclusively on physical screening as a means of protecting the airports. But of course, that would be inconsistent with at least two um, of the principles you know, that, we, that we've articulated. Right? One being the risk-based allocation of resources. You, know, you can do a better risk-based allocation if you know who's flying. And the other one uh, being, um, not layered security, what's the other one? Uh, yeah. well, uh, well, pushing out the borders, right? No, yeah, thank you. Uh, knowing what's happening uh, earlier, knowing who's coming, being able to think about what's happening. So as a policy matter, we've decided, America has decided, uh, that we want to know who's flying on a plane. That's why you have to give the TSA guy your little um, driver's license whenever you show up. Now, the legal question is, OK, is that, is that lawful? Do you actually have a right, perhaps, to fly anonymously? Right? Are you permitted to do that without? And uh, you are all much younger than I am, uh, except for a couple of people. But I remember a time uh, when uh, you could actually fly anonymously. The shuttle from New York to, uh, to Washington, you didn't need a reservation. You could get on board, take any empty seat, and they'd put a little push cart through uh, the aisle, and you could either give them your credit card, or you could pay cash. If you had $175, you could give them cash on the barrelhead, and nobody would know that you'd flown. Um, those days are long gone. Uh, you can't do that anymore. The question is whether it's lawful. The answer is that the Ninth Circuit was actually asked this question uh, by a man named Gilmore. Um, and he said, look, you know, I have the right to be able to travel without identifying myself. And the court said, no, you really don't have a right to travel by air, right? They analogized it to the requirement that you provide a social security number to get a driver's license. And they said he had a choice. He could leave the airport. He didn't have to fly. He could find some other way to get wherever it is he wanted to go. Now, that's true, right? I mean, you know, nobody has to fly, just like nobody actually has to get a driver's license. So this is a consent-based model, right? You are implicitly or in his case explicitly, consenting to the identification requirement simply by uh, deciding that you want to take a flight as opposed to drive your car. Um, but 
you should, we should all be honest about this. It's a little bit of a phony consent, right? I mean, it's, not, it's a long drive from LA to New York, right? Um, you know, uh, living in America without flying um, is pretty hard these days. So in a lot of ways, we're, we're adopting a sort of enforced consent statute here. Uh, it, it has the image of a de jure in fa you know, legitimate consent, but de facto, it's a little, it's a little bit strained of a, uh, of a consent idea. But nonetheless, that's where the law is today. So then the question comes, you know, what sort of ID should we require? I, I don't know if you've seen this before. But that's Mohammed Atta's uh, Florida driver's license, uh, which he, uh, he, he got by fraud uh, while he was living here in America. Uh, you know, name, picture, you all recognize him. Uh, this reflects the fact that today, can you hear me? Did we lose this? Okay, no, okay. Driver's licenses are pretty easy to forge. Um, you know, I, when I was younger, of course, I had a fake ID when I went to college so that I could go and drink. Um, I, I'm not going to ask whether any of you did because that would be wrong of me to do so. But uh, this is a weak point. I mean, having an ID requirement that doesn't rest upon a uh, strong ID is kind, of, is kind of a meaningless thing. It's a lot of strum and drong and a lot of effort with no benefit at all if, if he can get an, a, a license like this that readily. So government has adopted this idea. It's called the Real ID. It's, uh, it's about strengthening document security. It means if it goes into effect, and there's a big debate about it, and see the last two pieces, uh, that you won't be able to get a new driver's license without a, uh, a birth certificate, uh, without, uh, uh, and, and, and that in order to do that, since birth certificates can themselves be uh, pretty readily forged, we're going to create, maybe, a nationwide uh, database of birth certificates so that there will actually be, you go and get your North Carolina driver's license, but you were, say, born in Alabama, right? They will, they will be able to type into a computer and find out, yes, in fact, Nick was born in Mo Mobile, right? Mobile, you know, on thus and such a date at thus and such a time, and he's a legitimate person. A lot of people oppose it. Uh, some oppose, I mean, here are some of the reasons. Some oppose it because it's got this big brother state idea to it. Right? I mean, it sounds almost like a national ID card, right? Uh, some oppose it because it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars to develop something like a nationwide birth certificate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we don't do this, then all of the identification requirements at the airports are pretty much for naught and a waste of money. Uh, right now, we're in the worst of both possible worlds. We have the ID requirements. You have to go to the TSA guy. You have to give him your driver's license. Right? But we have no rules about strengthening uh, driver's licenses against fraud. So we're doing something uh, that provides little added benefit at huge cost without doing the follow through. So on the identification piece, we've got a policy that is only half effective and halfway implemented. And we haven't yet decided whether we're going to do it or not. Uh, we know that we can do it legally as a matter of law since we're in the law school. But we're still at the policy point of not knowing whether or not this is really wise. Uh, and whether or not we're going to follow through with it. Let's change topics and go to airport scanners. That one I'm sure you've all seen, right? This is, uh, these are uh, honest, uh, some, by the way, I should say some of the pictures that you get off of Google are frauds, especially the ones that really look like totally revealing. Technology doesn't actually strip you totally naked. But this isn't, you know, this isn't something you actually uh, are unsensitive to people. Uh, you can see quite a bit. You can see, for example, on this front right, pocket uh, the key that he's carrying. Uh, does I, do I have a pointer here? No. Nah. The, the, his key and his belt buckle, of course, and the gun in the back, right? Uh, uh, come on. OK. So the policy question, again, everything we do is a policy question and a law question. Uh, do we want them? Will they work? Um, and at what cost? Right? And the answer is, for metal things, they work very well. Uh, for uh, non-metal things, they work pretty well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can see here, just to his left, that's uh, probably a ticket. Just to the left of his belt buckle, probably a ticket or something like that. So they work pretty well. Um, it's an open question whether or not they would have spotted uh, the uh, small amount of plastic explosive that Abdul Muttalib had in his um, in his uh, in his underwear. I've heard people tell me that it's true that it would, but I haven't actually seen one of these photos yet, right? Uh, that, that proves it. So I'm waiting. I'm a bit of a skeptic. Um, the legal question is, you know, are there any privacy limitations on this? Right? Uh, yeah, this, this seems a little intrusive. 
And is this a search, right? You know, this is more than I could tell with a, a, uh, uh, without a Terry pat down, right? You know, if I did it, everybody knows what a Terry stop is, right? We've had Fourth Amendment law. You need, the police can't stop you on the street and pat you down. They have to have uh, some reasonable basis for it. They, we call it a reasonable suspicion, right? And this is a, this is a visual reasonable suspicion pat down uh, without suspicion, because you get pulled off for it often with nothing. So, uh, you know, those are the policy and legal questions we want to talk about. Here's another picture. You can tell, by the way, that the person on your left is a woman, uh, and the person on your right is a man. Um, right? Once again, you can see that it's pretty effective. That's her Blackberry and her cell phone there, right? Uh, not sure what it is on her right, that, but you can see her necklace. I wondered what was in her left shoulder. Um, I don't know what it is, right? Um, so here, here, here's something, here's just a little bit about the cost, because in the wake of Abdul Muttalib, we're driving ahead on this no matter what, right? Um, the policy questions have already been answered, and they've been answered by circumstances outside of our control. We can reflect on them, but this is what the uh, Obama administration has proposed, uh, $734 million to buy 500 new ones, New, new machines, I understand you have one at RDU, uh, so they're gonna double the number that we, ha uh, that we have. We're gonna add, uh, since it takes more time and we're gonna have to open up more lanes, uh, we're gonna have to add 255 new TSA officers and full employment opportunity if you haven't got a job yet, right? Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's part of a broader package that's also going to include more canine detection teams Right and uh, sixty million dollars for more of the, those little portable bomb dis bomb detection things where they swab your uh, they swab your uh, your luggage and then they stick it in and then it comes back bing 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 no uh, you know uh, bomb stuff or bing 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 no bomb stuff and in fact on the way down here today I read about the announcement of a new TSA policy they're going to start doing random swabs of people's hands um, with these new portable bomb detectors uh, because of course if you're carrying uh, plastic in your underwear you probably have a, a residue on the palm of your hand from having placed it in your underwear. So, um, uh, so we're gonna do this at, at departure gates, I gather, so within the United States. Uh, just announced in, in the news today. So everything I said is, you know, is a little out of tune, right? Because it changes every day. So these are, they're, I mean, you have to say, that's a pretty effective set of pictures, right? On the other hand, it's pretty invasive. Uh, yeah, we're getting something for sure, but we're losing something for sure. So how do we address these privacy concerns, right? Because you know, those pictures, if they were of you, you would be kind of a little, um, uh, little nonplussed, right? Well, there's three ways. The first is choice, right? There's, there's the Gilmore choice, which is you don't have to fly at all if you really don't like it. And the second choice is uh, that you're, you're allowed to elect a pat-down if you don't like the body scanner. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't really seem to me like it's a good choice. Um, in fact, I'll take the, the scanner every day to the pat down. But you know, it's good if we if we some people might choose otherwise, and you know, it's choice is good, right? You know, we allow people as many options as we can. That's the first one. The second one is data retention. Um, the way that they're going to run the system, uh, the images are not saved, um, and the hard drive is disabled, so that you won't be able to keep them. So uh, if Britney Spears goes through the uh, uh, through the uh, detector at, uh, at San Francisco Airport, the TSA officer, in theory, will not be able to save and say, hey, look, I got Britney Spears without her clothes on, right? The, the, the data retention is disabled. The third way that they're going to do this is something, disintermediation, I, I couldn't find a better word for it, but the, you're here in the scanner, and the guy who's reviewing the picture is off in another room where he can't see you, right? So he's behind the door looking at the scanner. If he sees a gun, he presses, a red button, and everybody comes and tackles you. But, um, but he's not there to do the reaction, right? So, and, and actually, that one makes me feel a little more comfortable. Because if the guy who's seeing the picture of me doesn't know that it's me, you know, and he can't say, oh, that Rosenzweig is fat. You know, he needs to lose 20 pounds. I feel a little better about that. So this is how we're addressing the privacy concerns. Uh, of course, the idea that you can't save them is kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, that looks like it was saved and printed out to me. So you actually have to disable um, the, uh, the uh, capacity to save. And you know, we can do that, right? But that, then that raises one of those classic questions about government use and abuse, right? If you're gonna have a machine that has a capacity in it that's disabled, you're gonna have to put in a whole oversight system to make sure that people don't cheat the system. 
You're going to have to audit it. You're going to have to watch. You're going to have to have systems for punishment in case TSA officers do try and print out the pictures of Britney Spears or something like that. Um, so you know, it's not an ineffective means, but it brings with it an entire mechanism for governmental control and, and enforcement that, um, that we need to talk about. Is it a search? Well, no, not really. Uh, this, the courts, these are both, uh, the sites are there. Uh, these are both, one's a Second Circuit, one's an Eleventh Circuit course. And they say basically, if the search is no more extensive than is necessary, in light of current technology, I like that, in light of current technology to detect weapons or explosives and is combined to a good faith effort to prevent the carrying of weapons, then it's okay. Uh, they can't, and again, you can avoid the search completely by electing not to fly. Um, What's notable about this is that even before we had this technology of, of body scanning, we were built the, building in a technology one-way ratchet into the law. So long as the current technology is used and is effective and is in good faith, um, the courts have said that airport security is sufficiently high of value that we're not going to pay any attention um, to the search aspects of this. Uh, in effect, again, on the basis of that um, consent idea or that semi-consent idea, is that, is that how I would characterize it? OK, so now we'll change to the third piece, data analysis, right? And that's actually looking at data about people in advance to find out whether or not they are who they say they are and whether or not they have terrorist connections. You know, and do, do, does it allow us to focus our investigative resources? I'm going to tell you now the answer is yes. You can actually discover things about connections between people. Uh, that you don't know on the face of it. Uh, and then, again, the legal issue is the privacy of all the innocent people whose data has been collected. Right, let me show you, uh, this is actually a takeoff on uh, something that happened um, back in the 1980s. This is a, a case uh, co uh, called Department of Justice versus Reporters Committee. Um, and what this reflects is the fact that computers have changed completely. Back in 1989, uh, the Department of Justice created its first database of criminal data about people. And in order to do that, they had to go all around the country and get the little pieces of data that were held by lots of different people. You know, the DA had the charging records, the police had the arrest records, the courts had the conviction records, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they went and they collected it all because they wanted to build profiles of mafia dons, right? Now, all that data was public. You or I could go around to the courthouses and do everything and get that data as well. But a very enterprising Philadelphia Inquirer report said, why should I go to 300 different places and, and collect all this information, right? Why don't I just submit a FOIA request um, uh, to the Department of Justice and get the, uh, he was looking for a Mafia Don's rap sheet, basically. And he had what I thought was a really, really uh, strong argument, right? His argument was, look, it's public information. It doesn't become private just because the, the um, uh, uh, U.S. Department of Justice is collected in one place. The Supreme Court unanimously, and this is a court that had Justice Brennan and Justice Rehnquist on it, so unanimous is big here, uh, said no, no. Uh, the privacy interest in maintaining the practical obscurity, because in practice it would be hard to get, is very high. You, you know, if you want to go, go to the archives yourselves and get it, but you can't uh, rely upon the fact that we, that the Department of Justice has done this huge effort to get it. Today, it's completely different. Uh, anybody know any of these companies, Axiom, Experian, ChoicePoint? Right? Axiom has, on average, 1,500 pieces of data on each and every one of you. If you're an adult American over the age of 18, that's their average. If you've done anything public right, or notable, uh, for example, like teach at a law school, say, um, the number of pieces of information they have on you is probably quintuple that, um, if not more. And they hire people to actually go to the courthouses and take down records. They have your birth records. They have um, your bridal records. They have kennel club records. Um, that one blew my mind, but they know what dogs you own. Um, uh, well, why not, right? They, we, one of the people they market to is people who want to sell you leashes and, uh, and, uh, and, and dog food. And no point in selling it to somebody who's a cat lover, uh, et cetera. So today, uh, unlike in 1989, right, the trove of information that is out there about any individual is immense. And you know, so uh, where, uh, where before we couldn't analyze it, now we can use it, not just to find out whether you have a dog, but of course whether, find out whether or not you are a terrorist or you have connections to terrorists, whether you do your banking in an account that has been connected to somebody in, uh, in Pakistan, 
whether your cell phone record is the record of a, has on it the record of a call from a phone number that we found in a safe house in Afghanistan. We can do that. Here's, a, here's an example. This is, this is after the fact, so it, it, it's, a little bit, um, it's a little bit unfair. But this is the stuff that had we tried to do it on September 10th, we could have. Uh, there were two guys, uh, Al-Hamzi and Al-Madar, who were actually on the INS watch list, right? Uh, and they made pl plane reservations on two of the 9-11 flights back in August 2001, right? So if we'd actually been checking the watch lists against the plane um, passenger manifest, we'd have been able to know that two of them were planning to fly that day, right? Now, they used two addresses, address one and address two. Both are in Florida, right, At, on their reservations, right? Turns out that three additional passengers, Ada, Al Shahi and Al Hamzi used the same addresses when they made reservations for the same day. So if we link people by addresses, we'd have five of them identified. Then, of course, Atta had a Florida phone. Well, that was his contact number. You know, call me back if my plane's delayed. Uh, right? Five more guys used the exact same phone number as their callback. Right? So if we'd taken the phone numbers from known people connected to known terrorists, now we're at 10. Right? Now, this one is my favorite. Because Al-Madar actually had a frequent flyer number, which shows you that Al-Qaeda is uh, frugal, if not so intelligent, right? Uh, and and Makhdeh also used the same frequent flyer number. So there we are with 11 of them, right? Now, Al-Hamzi and Al-Madar, so, and I've done that just by looking at the information they gave to the airline, right? Their frequent flyer number, their phone number, their contact address. If I actually take their address and run it against public address, uh, information, like uh, uh, PO boxes or, or addresses that, that the US Postal Service has on you, I get three more. I'm up to 13, right? Now I got to start another chain, right? Uh, Al-Gahamdi was uh, actually on another list, not the watch list, but an expired visa list. So I start with him, and he used the same address live, and lived with all the rest of them. So, I got nine, all 19 of them through data analysis in advance, all in essentially seven clicks of the mouse. So to answer the legal, po the policy question, does it work? Yeah, it does. And uh, if you go back and read uh, the most recent one that you will see is, uh, is uh, uh, Zazi, Najibullah Zazi. If you go back and you read the complaint, he was, to, he was identified in part based upon his trips to Pakistan uh, and the, and the data he left behind on his travel logs with some other people who the government was worried about, who are identified in the affidavit as number one and number two, right? Okay, but what about privacy? Because in order to get that data, I had to sift through all the data of everybody flying on every flight every day. And that includes you and me, right? And we're all nice people. Well, we've got privacy laws now that, are, that have limitations on how the government can use this data. These are some of them. I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to buzz through this one. But the basic answer is these laws were written in 1974, right? And they have limitations on how one uses data and, and maintains privacy that are completely out of date uh, with our technology and with what we want to do with them. To take just one example, um, an individual uh, openness and individual participation are two principles that says the average citizen should be allowed to see what data the United States government has about him and correct it if it's wrong. And you know, that makes sense, right? If the government thinks that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm somebody else or that I've, I've, I've violated um, some law in St. Louis back in 1963 and I was you know, five at the time and was living in New York, I should be able to correct that. But you, know, you can't match that with giving uh, Mohammed Atta the right to see what data the United States government has about him and correct it. No, no, I'm, I'm not a terrorist, you know, really. Um, we need a different method of dealing with this. <coughs> so. Uh, those are the three issues I wanted to talk about. Then here are some of the others, and I'm going to buzz through them in about 60 seconds just so I can invite you to talk about them. Watch listing. You get on a watch list, right? Part of this is, is we, we started with them on a watch list, right? What if you're put on the watch list wrong, right? Government thinks something wrong about you. How do you get yourself off? Haven't really answered that. My favorite, spot, suspicious pattern observation training. You'll see the, these guys, they're plain clothes at RDU. They're TSA, but they're not in uniform. What they're doing is watching. They've been trained to observe suspicious patterns in people, right? And they actually are pretty good. They, they'll see people who are kind of sweating or furtive or, um, 
Uh, one of the big tells, and I'll, I'll tell you guys, because I assume you're all lawful, right, and all, is um, if people avoid, people who are doing things that are bad, they avoid the dogs, right? So if the do dogs are sitting over on this side, the people who go that way tend to have a tendency to be people we want to spend more time. But it's, you know, it, you know, it, it easily gets into profiling if you want to go that. Should we have armed pilots, right? You know, I mean, we've allowed pilots to be armed now. What if one pilot shoots the other pilot? Right? and then crashes the plane. Um, none of this applies to small aircraft. Right? You know, if you know anything about nuclear weapons, you know that a small Learjet uh, could carry one just as readily as a large commercial aircraft. Yet we do almost nothing um, to, uh, to, do, to uh, monitor what goes in on general aviation aircraft that are coming from Europe or, or, or Asia or the Middle East. 100% bag screen, that's a requirement that Congress has put in place. It violates um, our risk-based allocation of resources. It's going to cost a huge amount of money. But they've said by 2014, we must screen every bag going on an airplane. Uh, not just the handhelds, but all the ones in the hold as well. And the liquid ban, right? Um, are we ever going to be allowed to carry on that much water again? Uh, they're actually working on technology that might do that. The reason for the liquid ban is because uh, water, H2O, looks a lot like hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which was a key ingredient in some of these explosives. But if we could get a system that tells me that this is water, not H2O2, we can get rid of the liquid ban. So anyway, that's a quick romp through the theory and practice of aviation security policy and a little bit of law. Um, as I said at the outset, there's a lot more policy than law here, because by and large, the court's reaction to this has been Whatever the executive says it needs, you know, we'll give them. Um, there aren't a lot of limitations out there. So mostly it's about good judgment um, or bad judgment, depending upon uh, your perspective. And with that, we've got 10 minutes for Q&A. Anybody want to ask anything? This topic, the three that are there, other ones. Yes, ma'am. If the liquid plot has succeeded over the transatlantic, you know, they wouldn't have been able to get anything actually from the planes. Mm -hmm. So I, at that point, I would think they would want to review the files. But if they're deleted, then they're not going to find anything. So how long would they keep the report to delete? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you've actually asked the policy question they've asked. Right now, the plan is um, if they don't see anything right there and you get through, the, the idea is to delete it then. Um, so within uh, minutes, right? They, they, of course, can save it. <laughs> And will save it if they spot the gun on you, because then that's evidence that you're, that you're a crime. And you've made exactly the argument that some of us, myself included, honestly, made about, um, <clears throat> about the data retention period. We thought it should be on the order of three days, right? Because you know, that would give us time enough to, to at least have the suspicion that we want to go back and look. Um, right now, that's not the plan. Um, but the, plan, you know, one, the other thing about Homeland Security is plans change all the time. So what I tell you today may not be what they do next week or what they implement in the end. I would go for something like three days, just on the who knows theory, right? You, sir? <clears throat> on a policy level, can we afford to implement the Israeli model, uh, which, of course, is considered the creme de la creme in security? I don't think so. Um, our, our assessment was, does everybody know the Israeli model? They essentially require you to show up five hours in advance. They talk to you at length. The idea is to use an individual way of, of building a profile on you. They look through all your bags. Um, Ben-Gurion Airport has um, you know, uh, 1,500 uh, departures a day, you know, maybe 2,000 on a good day. We have 2 million emplanements every day in the United States. We have 87 million international departures and arrivals. Um, the data analysis piece that I suggested there is our kind of halfway house, right? It's a way of trying to build a profile of people not through direct interactions, but through knowing more about the images they left back in cyberspace. The other portion of it is uh, I can't even begin to imagine what the costs would be. Well, they're, they're moving in an additional direction ID card, which already has your 
if we have Clear Channel, which already vets people ahead of time, mm -hmm. Clear Channel doesn't work because the TSA doesn't accept it. Mm -hmm. However, this is something that might be more than an in-between way. It, it might be. One of the things that we've talked about, Clear Channel is that registered traveler program where you give, the, where you give over information and then you get, a, you get cleared and you get, to, you get to at least go through a fast lane, but in theory you would be able to avoid um, any screening at all. The problem is um, we don't trust it. I mean, we the government. I'm not in the government anymore, but the government doesn't trust it. And the reason they don't trust it is not because they don't believe in the, um, in the uh, efficacy of their vetting process. They do. But people change, right? Uh, you know, uh, the guy that we vetted today, we've got to continuously vet every day to see that something didn't happen in the six months since Right? That may uh, take Abdul Muttalib. I mean, he's a perfectly good example. He was vetted and he was given a visa um, you know, six months before he went to Yemen. Something happened to him. I don't know what it is that made him go kind of around the bend in, in radicalization. So, unless you're going to continuously vet all cleared people every day you know, for, against every new piece of information, <coughs> you know, the vetted model in a large scale system is a challenge for us. That, I mean, that's why we haven't done it so far. I see lots and lots of hands. OK, I got uh, one, two, three, four. We're going to go in that direction. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get to you, I promise. With uh, recent developments in technology and like facial recognition and that kind of stuff, how soon will it be before the fish pattern observation training becomes completely computerized? Um, 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> My, my prediction, it, it, you know, right now facial recognition is very uh, rudimentary. It can, if you give it a good, you know, if I stand still, take off my glasses, look right in, it can tell, match this picture to my, my driver's license pretty well. State Department runs a program like that because passport photos are, you know, exactly like that. Going from there to observing nervous behavior, big step, not yet done. Um, very, un, very likely that um, Congress won't let people do that, right? I mean, you know, observation at a distance of nervous behavior, that, you, I mean, you know, we haven't found an endpoint yet. Congress seems to let all of these things happen because they're afraid of being anti-security. But I'm, I'm, I'm sus I suspect that that one would be the bridge too far. Who knows? Sir? I'm just curious, like the airport scanners, is there any way it can be patched up like, inside your body? Like, what if, like no. Um, then what would happen if like, a terrorist really wanted to like, maybe like, search the implant, like explosive inside of Well, we actually, we, uh, the, the scanner doesn't work on that. That's actually something, it's known as the booty bomb. Um, and and you, you laugh, but uh, Mohammed bin Nayef, the interior minister of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, was uh, subject to a booty bomb attack. Uh, a, um, a, a terrorist who, who was not, who was vetted, uh, but not known. Uh, was admitted to see him, and when he was in there, um, he had had his entire, forgive me, i got to use the word, anal orifice, um, stuffed with plastic explosive. And his friends outside, when he, when he was in there, blew it up, uh, only because they mistimed it a bit, and Bin Nayef was about as far as I am uh, from Sarah, at, you know, uh, as, as opposed to this close. Only because of that did Bin Nayef actually survive. Um, of course, the bomber did not. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, the current technology, the airport scanners, uh, they're, they're millimeter wave, so they actually bounce off of your skin, right? And what they're doing is differentiating the responsiveness of metals or plastic as opposed to uh, your watch or your, uh, your skin. But we can't see the booty bomber yet. I'm sure someday they will figure out a way to do that, which will be even more interesting. Um, Ma'am. father had come to the U.S. Embassy. So what is in place in order to make this system more integrated and make the databases available to all aspects of the security process? Yeah, well, that's a great question, and it, it requires a much more detailed answer because I actually have a view on it that is different than most people. Um, what's my, in my view now, and this is, I, I hesitate, I hasten to say it is not the uniformly accepted view, but um, is that 
this, the, the uh, underwear bomber was not a problem of information collection. We had information. They had the, the NSA intercept in, um, uh, about somebody in Yemen. They had a half name, Umar Farouk. What our problem is right now is we don't do enough data analysis. Um, uh, we, those are 10 bits of information. They are floating in a sea of millions of pieces of information right now. Um, the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, has access to 80 separate databases. They get over 50,000 new pieces of information every day. They put 35, they, or they vet for whether or not to put on 3,500 new names every day to add to the watch list, right? I mean, they're already running flat out. The problem is um, uh, that we lack time. We fail of imagination because our analysts are overwhelmed with data. What we probably need, and this, you know, it's a scary thing to say, but what we probably need is even more automated kinds of, of things, such that instead of an analyst having to say, oh my god, Umar Farouk, let's look at all the Umar Farouks, you know, a computer system sa says, you know, Umar Farouk and whatever the other 10,000 pieces are, and does that routinely. I mean, because what, what, what the problem with Abdul Muttalib was, was a lack of uh, imagination and urgency. Somebody didn't raise the Yemen bomb, Umar, Nigerian thing to the top of the pile, right? But you can't expect people to do that uh, all the time because they're overwhelmed. They don't know whether it's that one. I mean, in hindsight, it's easy, right? <coughs> a father coming in and saying, my son's a radical, you know, that sounds like everybody should have known it. But, you know, I don't know what else was in on the same day, but probably on the same day was a, you know, something about an IED manufacturing facility in Pakistan, something about a, a plot in Denmark to go after the guy who wrote the cartoons. You know, so how are they supposed to know? You need to actually automate the systems uh, so that a more comprehensive review is routinized. The downside of that is the systems are automated. And a comprehensive review is routinized. And that means it's routinized not just to Umar Farouk, but you and me. You know, so cost benefit. It's not a, so that's my, my view on this. You, sir. I was just wondering how uh, bombings like the London bombings and the March 11th bombings in Madrid, uh, you know, discussions of attempts to detonate bombs on the you know, New York subway really fit into your, I guess, your analysis suggesting that people are only fixated on airports. Uh, because it seems to me that there are attacks that occur in other places and are likely to occur, and I'm wondering if maybe the concentration on airports is more a question of needing or wanting to do something and that only being a confined place. Because if you look at things like a, an attack in a, a mall, like in a consumer-based society where you know m most of our economic growth is no longer manufacturing, but it's people going to Gap, you set up one bomb in a mall, and nobody goes to a mall anywhere in the U.S. for two months. You know, those, those are great questions. Um, you know, <clears throat> if I had to say the one thing that I woke up every day for five years asking was, how come they haven't attacked the mall in, uh, uh, the mall of America in Minnesota? That would be what I would do. Um, or, or how come they haven't done the New York subway? Uh, there are two answers to it. Uh, the the A answer, the good answer. Or, or the more persuasive answer is, for reasons that uh, we do not understand with respect to us, America, as opposed to the UK or Spain, they seem to be fixated on planes. It may very well be because we've made it um, very hard for them to get operatives into the United States. And so they may think that they have to focus on things at the periphery because sneaking somebody in through Dulles won't happen as readily this time. That's a answer. Uh, a second answer that you alluded to is simply that I don't know what I would do you know, to protect the New York subway. Do you know how many? We, we actually counted. Do you know how many entra separate entrances there are to the New York subway system? Guess, yeah, yeah, 5,200 and you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, can, we're, are we going to put metal detectors, bomb detectors at 5,000? Can you see New Yorkers standing for that, <laughs> waiting to get uh, you know, uh, Yes, exactly. My, my boss, uh, Michael Chertoff, got in trouble because when the uh, London bomb plot happened, he actually said he made he made a faux pas, which in Washington is saying the truth in public. <laughs> and he said, they, somebody asked him about New York. He said, "There's nothing we can do about it. You know, what we need to focus on there is resiliency, being able to rebuild, 
you know, quickly, get people uh, in and out, uh, respond, save people's lives, and you know, redundant. Uh, and Senator Chuck Schumer had him up in front of his committee you know, two days later, and he was doing what politicians do when they've made that sort of mistake. He's bowing and scraping and saying, <laughs> we were going to work hard with the New York Police Department to find cooperative mechanisms for enhancing. You know, it was, he, he said the truth. So part of the answer is, you know, if I protect the Mall of America, how about the uh, Pentagon City Mall? Uh, I don't know, what's your biggest mall here? Okay, how about South Point, right? I mean, uh, there are 10 million malls in America. Uh, so okay, how much longer we got here, Nick? As much time. Uh, I'll, I'll keep going until you guys want to. May I add something to the data? Sure. The thing from the uh, airport and airline side that really failed in the uh, underpants armor was red flags should go up and be connected to something with one-way tickets no baggage, he actually, he actually, and, ca and cash payment. He actually and had a return one, ticket. Any one of those yeah. by itself is not a problem because many international travelers pay with cash. Mm -hmm. But if all three are in the same person, you know, it's stupid for them to even do that. They don't have to do that. Yeah. That's all three are individual red flags. When you put them together, you got a problem. From The airline is aware of that right up front. I think, I think probably KLM should have been a little more on the ball, though it, it turns out in the end he had a return ticket, which is kind of cuts out one, one of your three legs. I mean, that's a, a factoid that came out. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah, but I agree, KLM should do better. I've got who? I got one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Four. Yes, ma'am. Are they doing that too slow, or are they just not doing it at all? Um, they are doing it. Um, they are doing it as fast as they can. They are overwhelmed. It is not as automated. The initiation for it has to be some insight into a threat, right? I can, if I start by saying, oh, let's, you know, let's look for Yemenis um, named Umar, right, or, 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 or Nigerians named Umar, then, you know, the rest of it is easy. But you know, the Nigerian name Umar is in this pile that's this high, right? And something has to move it to up here. They do that. That's how they got, uh, they, they did observe Zazi uh, with his connections to some people that they knew about. Um, I'll tell you another story. Um, a fellow named Raid Albania, uh, 2004, I think it was, uh, he arrived at, um, at uh, Chicago's O'Hare on a flight from London. Uh, originating uh, in Jordan, he had a valid Jordanian passport, valid visa. Um, uh, so this was late in the game, right? He arrived there, but something in the data, and I, I can't tell you what because I'm not allowed to, um, made him be pulled aside for secondary inspection, and in fact, he was sent back home. Uh, so he was not allowed to enter the United States. This was in 2004. Uh, later that year, um, his, uh, they take his fingerprints when he's turned away. Right? That's kind of standard. Later that year, they found his hands. Uh, uh, handcuffed to the steering wheel of a car bomb that had blown up and killed 133 people in Iraq. Um, so, you know, they do that. You know, what was he going to do when he came to Chicago? I don't know. I mean, you know, nobody does, right? Maybe he was coming to visit Disney World. But I doubt it. Um, and so, you know, stuff like that happens. M many of the successes don't become public, of course, uh, because many of the things that, that are, are um, our triggers, if we publicly say them out loud, they don't become very good effective triggers anymore. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, it's maybe eight, ten a year, right, uh, that are spotted this way that becomes something. And there are lots of false leads. And every one that's a false lead is somebody like you and me who gets inconvenienced and maybe sent back even though we should have been allowed to enter America. You know, everything has a cost. And you know, in the criminal law, right, we say better that 10 guilty go free than that one innocent be punished. Right? That's, that's a, a value judgment about respect to false positives and false negatives. <clears throat> um, the equation is, is being differently applied in the terrorist context. I, I think rightly so, but there's a huge debate in America about whether or not that change is right. Uh, you, yeah? First of all, I'm a little shocked. I'm, I'm shocked that there's not sort of some sort of computer algorithm working through all this data. I think if the public knew that, there would be, you know, 
a, a big, pretty big response. But uh, second of all, if there's any privacy concerns going on with that or any of the other privacy concerns, isn't airport security, especially at this time, a compelling state interest? Uh, I invite you to go back to something called total information awareness, uh, which was a program that's actually the research program that was begun at DARPA um, right after 9-11 that was intended to you know, work at developing these algorithms. I mean, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. You can't just kind of throw a simple algorithm at it and build it. Um, they had two problems wrong with it, right? The first was that they had a really scary name, total information awareness. The second one was that the guy who came in and did it was a guy named John Poindexter, also famous for um, Iran-Contra as, as a defendant, not as a, not as a, as a prosecutor. Um, so a large portion of the official government research into what are called, are broadly under the rubric of something called knowledge discovery techniques. That's the way that computer scientists talk about this. This is knowledge discovery. They think the knowledge is there and they've got to massage algorithms to discover it, um, was actually shut down. Uh, in 2002, 2003, precisely uh, because too many people um, saw that system as uh, Big Brotherish. There's a famous article by William Sapphire before he died. You know, it was entitled "Big Brothers Watching You." And you know, total information awareness. John Poindexter, database of everything. You know, you know, they'll know uh, what your political affiliations are. Um, that you're giving money to Democrats. And you know, if you fear government abuse. You fear a system like that. So the answer to your question is uh, our approach of what we've, we in America have been uh, using an approach avoidance thing. You know, we approach it. Congress said, go try and do this. Poindexter goes and does it. People get afraid. We stop doing it. Uh, we do a little bit of it. We stop doing it. Now after Abdul Muttalib, there's this big push where we're going off to go do it again, right? And I'm 100% confident in predicting only one thing, which is that about a year from now, there'll be a big privacy backlash, and we'll stop doing it. Because um, that's the way government works. Uh, somebody over here. Yes, you, sir. It seems, at least from the outside, that most of these extra security measures are for the most part reactionary to is, is that true, or is that just how things are outside, and why is that? Um, some are, some are not. Um, uh, I would say things like the liquid ban, yeah, clearly uh, reactive in nature. Things like spot, not. I mean, that's an attempt to take a completely different approach right, uh, to airport security screening and basically expand the envelope. That's, that's how they describe it. Right? Airport security right now is, is the single point. right? And if you know anything about um, systems analysis, if there's a single point of failure you know, and it breaks down, you're toast. Um, so spot is about expanding the zone right, to, to the front lobby. Right? I mean, they're not there at the gate where you're going like this. They're, they're back when you're checking in, checking your bags, uh, parking your car, driving up. Um, there's a, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a, a program in Boston um, that uses optical character readers to run license plates of all cars going into the airport now. Um, it's a novel, it's a new test thing. You may think it's bad, you may think it's good, but the idea is you know, it, expand the zone even further, right? We're pushing the borders out, basically border of the airport as opposed to the border of the United States. You know, and if it's a car that's registered to somebody bad, we can react before he gets in. Um, I, you, know, you could uh, see a, a day in the not too distant future where if you have a criminal record, you're not allowed to fly. Um, I'm not sure that'd be a good thing. Uh, you know, but I can kind of peer off into the future. So I, I, the basic answer to your question is, um, a large fraction of it is reactive, but it had better be because if it doesn't, you'll lose your, your politicians will lose your job. Right? Well, we need to wrap up. Last question then. Um, you, you spoke about automating the system more, but um, I have concerns. You watch the behavior of a Google, Google PageRank, an automated system, and how that gets game. If you automate the system too much, are you opening yourself up to the risk that the terrorists will use some botnet somewhere to spam you with stimuli they believe will raise? more red flags than you can deal with and let them slip in their, uh, their operatives or, or do their activity? That's a great question. It seems to me only human beings are going to be able to just operate correctly in that environment. Uh, that's a great question. There are two answers to it. Um, uh, the first is uh, yes, uh, 
one of the pieces of this that I didn't articulate is that the automated piece of it is only part of it. There's, got, there's always going to be the human analysis that comes with it uh, for precisely that reason. Um, and the other one is, <clears throat> you know, the attack itself would be a signature, right? Uh, so, so, so a botnet attack, yeah. You know, and then you get into the spoof, and then the spoof of the spoof, and the spoof of the spoof, and eventually it peters out. But yes, we, we would clearly be vulnerable to, a, to a, a concerted attack with too much stimuli to us. On the other hand, we like to think that if we notice that we were being overstimulated, we'd step back, say, OK, let's turn that off, and let's, you know, let's, let's go look by hand for what's going bad. And, the, and, the, and you know, the basic answer to your question, though, and it really happens in all these things, is you know, each move and each counter move, you know, there's only two possibilities. Either you despair completely and you don't make any moves because you know that there are counter moves to all of them, or you just keep going, right? I mean, uh, to my mind, the information arms race. Yeah, or, or, or in a physical arms race. I mean, you know, to, in, my, in, in all of these things, what we're doing is we're raising the costs to the other side of success. That doesn't mean that they can't be successful, right? And at some point, we're, we're spending too much money, right? I don't know where that is. Nobody can actually say that. But, um, uh, but you know, I actually look at Abdul Muttalib, and I see, you know, I, I see some signs of success there. I mean, you know, they had to dig very deep into a, a long bench to find him, right? Uh, it's pretty much a revenge attack for our, our killing uh, our drone attacks in Pakistan, which which means that they're kind of being reactive to us as opposed to us being reactive to them. Um, you know, it wasn't. You know, I would have very much wished that we had caught it much earlier and stopped him in, in Schiphol Airport or something like that. But there are some good things in there. It's not all black and white. There's a lot of gray, and there's some white in that event, notwithstanding. Um, I, I'm told we must end. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you again for the warm weather and for your attention. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>